prepared with the electrical support team at Cape Canaveral in Florida. On that team, he currently supports the D5 sustainment programs for cables, harnesses, and associated hardware. Prior to joining Lockheed Martin in 2019, Patrick worked at General Dynamics Electric Boat. Believe it or not, Patrick, I've actually been there at Groton, Connecticut. Um, also worked at GE Aviation and Rolls-Royce Corporation. He studied electrical engineering for his undergraduate degree at Penn State, great school for engineering, and specializes in electromechanical systems. A lover of military history, which I think is already obvious, um, Patrick pulls from its successes and failures to guide his teams and develop a product. Outside of work, he enjoys time with his family, leatherworking, martial arts, and camping. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and disappear from the screen. Let Patrick uh, share his screen, if you would please, and start the webinar. So Patrick, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thank you all for dialing in to listen. I'm gonna share my screen. You should see a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna to go to full screen for presentation mode. As soon as it'll let me. There we go. Okay. All right. Sun Tzu, The Art of War. I thought I heard from the broadsword to the ballroom, but it's from the broadsword to the boardroom. Uh, the Art of War is more of a what to do and not how to do. Uh, most of the work we see today, everybody wants to know, well, how do I do that? How do I fix this? How do I become better? And Sun Tzu takes it more from a general approach where I'm going to give you a goal and how you get there is up to you. Uh, from historical example, more recent history, General Patton was very big on this. Don't tell somebody how to do it. Tell them what you want them to do and let them surprise you with their ingenuity. Uh, going through these, we have about 14 slides. I'm going to take a break around slide seven. So if there are any questions, you don't have to wait till the very end. You just start letting them pour in. Uh, we'll take a break. And if there are any questions, I'll try to answer those then. And afterwards, we can try to continue on and still try to leave a little bit of time at the end if there's any more Q&A. <clears throat> Uh, process for uh, sharing these different slides and these quotes is to go through the quote where there's only about, like I said, there's only a couple of them in there. I mean, the book of Sun Tzu is, you can read it in a weekend. It's not that difficult to read through, and there's a whole lot in there. So these are just bits and pieces, just kind of giving an introduction. But pull one of the quotes, expand upon it, provide a military historical example, and follow up with a business example. <clears throat> Both business and war in our in all of our lives, everybody at one point in time has gone through both of them. And when I get a little bit more into, into this, you'll try to under, you'll see understand a little bit more. Uh, you know, what does it mean for you know the housewife to go to war or for uh, uh, the teacher to go to war? And without further ado, we'll uh, start into it. So Sun Tzu, you know, military advisor and leader, wrote the Art of War back in 500 BC. So very, very, very old manual. Still required reading for officers at West Point and other military schools. Uh, does somebody else have their microphone? I'm hearing some background clatter. Okay, thank you. Uh, other military schools, especially our uh, enemies across the pond, the Russians and the Chinese, are very, very fond of this manual. For us, we need to see that a corporation our department, our groups, is not any different than an army. An army has divisions, battalions, companies, platoons, squads, fire teams, individual soldiers, and our corporations are broken down similarly. From a business application, war is just a metaphor for conflict. Whenever you have disagreement, you have conflict. You go to negotiate the deal on a car. The car dealership wants the maximum. We want to pay the minimum. We have a conflict. You want to buy something or you want to try to acquire a product and you've got another rival business that wants it too. Well, you're going to have conflict. And the rules and the guidance in the art of war can actually help you resolve that conflict to your benefit. Our enemy, though, is whoever or whatever that conflict is with. As I said, your enemy can be another corporation. Your enemy can be an individual. Your enemy can be the product that you are trying to push across the finish line. It's whoever you're having a conflict with. So 
is you if you do pick up a copy of the Art of War and try to read through it, and it's talking about who the enemy is and who you're going to war with and having a battle. I mean, we're not walking into the boardroom with a flamethrower and a hand grenade, although sometimes midway through the boardroom meetings we might be thinking that. Uh, it's really just talking about conflict and how to resolve conflict. One point to keep in mind, though, is that going to war can be costly. And so there's got to be benefit beyond hubris or our pride or ego. Got to put a foundation. There are three theaters, modern war, strategic, operational, and tactical. Most of us live at the tactical level, the day-to-day -day work, the day-to-day -day grind. You're creating drawings, you're testing products. That's the tactical. Operational is how are all these products fitting into a much larger assembly? And the strategic is that assembly is going into something larger. It's becoming part of a city grid. It's part of a ship. It is part of a bridge construction. And that bridge construction, that ship, uh, that compartment is going to be used all over the world, not just right down the street. But the tactics that we do day to day on the ground level, if you have a bad strategy from above, your good tactics can still save that bad strategy. We've all been in the situation where you've heard, hey, we need to get this done, and we told you you could have it done next month. Uh, no, we, this is something that takes three months. Using good tactics, you can actually save that bad strategy. Vice versa, if you don't have good tactics, you can ruin even the best strategy. There are currently four generations in modern warfare that we're aware of. First generation, talking order and war. Prior to this, think about two masses of armies with swords and shields just smashing into each other and having at it. Somewhere around the 1600s, after the gun had been invented, somebody thought it'd probably be better to have these guys marching in a nice line or in a column and delivering volley fire into the enemy. So order and war came about around the 1600s and then the British perfected that you think about the Revolutionary War with massive groups of redcoats marching in formation. From a business side, this is about processes. You will march this way. You will fire in this direction. You will fall when I tell you to fall. You'll advance when I tell you to advance. And you will not run until I tell you to run. You're an automaton. You're just going through the motions. Second generation war came around, around the uh, uh, First World War, we started talking about superior firepower. Somebody named Maxim came up with a machine gun, and all of a sudden marching in formation became absolute suicide. What we do, we're talking about we're talking about superior firepower in businesses, and some businesses do have superior firepower. They have money they can throw at it. They have an unlimited supply of technicians and engineers that they can throw at a problem, and it all comes up with the same thing. Uh, I want status updates. Why are we not moving faster? Why are we not moving forward faster? The guys in World War I, they were fighting in the trenches. The officers, they were telling them to go forward, had no idea what they were up against. So when they would lose men, they just throw more men into it. So for in the third generation, which is what a lot of the fighting going around today is still in, we call maneuver warfare. The German army in Second World War was very, very, very adept. Think about the Blitzkrieg. Uh, they would fire at you over here and then move over to your left. While you were real shooting where they were, they started shooting at you from another direction. For businesses, we started talking about innovation, telling people, hey, you're allowed to think outside the box. I want you to think on your own. You get a better idea to beat this, I want to hear it. And I'm going to empower you to actually give you the authority to go make that happen. I want to see your idea fast. I don't want to see it six months from now or six years from now. You got an idea, you can put it across the board. I want to see it now. Again, maneuver, get the business to maneuver in a faster, more cyclic way so that you can get ahead of your opponent. While they're still reacting to what you did last year, you're already moving on to what you're going to be doing in years from now. Finally, in the fourth generation war, we're talking about moral war. It's kind of hard to think about that in moral warfare, but a good way to look at that is I think about the Vietnam conflict. We're at war. Uh, soldiers will tell you we won the battles, but we lost the war for the hearts and minds of the people. And we're still in that today, even with the battle and terror. And for businesses, you've got to fully decentralize, go agile. And I don't mean agile isn't hot desking, but allow your people you know, the freedom to say, hey, this isn't working out. I'm going to go do something different. I'm still given the goal. Remember I said before, this is more of a what to do, not a how to do. I need you to accomplish this goal. I need you to develop that prototype. OK, well, what we were doing isn't working, so I'm going to go off in a completely different direction. And I'm trusted and given the freedom 
to go do it. But on top of that, from the moral perspective, is winning right. Going in and just crushing your competition can make you look like a David and a Goliath, and that tends to not look too well for you in the newspapers. And most of our modern armies and businesses are still stuck in second and third generation war. Some have moved on to fourth generation. All right, start getting into the quotes. From Sun Tzu, the best thing of all is to take the enemy intact. To shatter and destroy them is not as good. Just to simply to beat them is not supreme excellence or, ex or uh, excellent, so, tacti or excellent yeah, tacticians. The impacts on your side. I'm sorry? So hence the fight and conquer and all your battles, not supreme excellence, but supreme excellence consisting in the breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. And I call this uh, slide the clash of the titans. Everybody out there wants a piece of the pie that you're trying to grab a hold of, regardless of what your business is doing. And some of those businesses out there have vast resources at their disposal. Trying to take on a business that is a titan can be a bit of a challenge if you're not a titan. But watching two titans hash it out is just like trench warfare. And when the battle is over, one side's victorious, but there's not much left to celebrate. You think about World War I and the guys in the trenches, and they shot at each other, they blew the ground up between them, and when it was all over, it was a barren wasteland with a whole lot of dead bodies. From business side, think about airline industries. Think about them trying to undercut each other. I can sell it to you, I can get you your seat for 200 bucks, I'll do it for 150, I'll do it for 125, I'll give you a free upgrade with pretzels and drinks. But when it's over, we end up with a tighter airplane with more seats all packed into a tighter space. Yeah, we're paying uh, less money for a ticket, but it's not the most comfortable way to travel anymore. What we try to do is we want to try to capture our markets, try to capture product lines, try to do it through stealth innovation, try to do it through speed instead of just brute force. Ideally, when our rivals... Ideally, when our rivals realize what we've done, it's too late to mount a response. They simply cannot get their people moving fast enough. This is where a smaller, more nimble company has an advantage over more of a Goliath company. To try and fight us or to try to take the uh, field from us becomes too expensive and they just simply surrender the field. Good example is Elon Musk and his Falcon Heavy. And when I saw these rockets a couple of years ago, this was something right out of Flash Gordon. I watch those rockets go up and I've seen rockets go up many times with the space shuttles. When these things came down and landed on their tails, that was something special. It was afterwards that we realized what Elon Musk was doing. He wasn't thinking about putting junk in space or sending stuff to the ISS. He's thinking intercontinental travel with these rockets. His goal is from anywhere to anywhere in 20 minutes or less. You want to be in Tokyo in 20 minutes? No problem. You want to be in Australia? You don't have to take two days to get there. Anywhere to anywhere in 20 minutes. The people who make the airline engines like General Electric and Rolls-Royce are scrambling trying to find a way to get into this market. Elon Musk is already there. He's simply perfecting his rockets. The military tactics are like underwater for water and its natural course will run from high to low. So in war, we want to avoid what's strong and strike what is weak. In short, you know, hit them where it hurts. Good example from history is the Maginot Line. Uh, the Second World War, I mean, France wanted to make sure the Germans were never going to catch them with their pants down again. So they built this huge wall from the bottom part of their border with Germany up to the top part of their border between Luxembourg and Germany. This wall was formidable. Big guns, wa high walls, thick walls. But for whatever reason, they just put little weak fortifications all the way up to Belgium because Belgium was their ally in the First World War. But France didn't understand that when you've got a megalomaniac that wants to take over the world, what do a few borders make any difference? And they simply bypassed the Maginot Line and went right into France through Belgium. And a direct frontal assault, as in Germany's case, would have been very costly. So instead, they went around. And such can be the said for uh, on the business side. Best way to deal with a formidable wall, like something like the Maginot Line, you reduce it. You want to reduce the enemy to reframe the problem, what I call reduction theory. Hey. Everything and everyone is reducible. A good example, if you will, you think about um, uh, St. Peter's Basilica. 
down in the Vatican City, all in Rome. If you've ever seen it from the outside, it's magnificent. If you've ever been inside, it's even more magnificent. And people come in and go out, and they're just completely in awe of the building. But what is it? It's a building. And it has the same problems and the same weaknesses as any other building, no different than your house. It's just a lot bigger and a lot more expensive. In the case of the Maginot Line, what did the Germans see? A wall. And all walls have a beginning and an end. And they found where the end was. We want to look for that chink in that armor and exploit it. Nothing and nobody can be strong everywhere. Everybody's got a weakness. You simply have to figure it out. Good example in our business is Japanese autos. And at the beginning, when they were coming into our country, like in the 50s, they've been here for a while, but they were imports in the 50s. People laughed at them. They were a four wheeled lawnmower with two seats. They could never compete with the Chryslers, the Fords, the Lincolns, the Caddies. There was, it was a joke. And they laughed at them until the late 70s when the gas crisis hit. And all of a sudden, the eight miles to the gallon uh, Ford didn't look as promising as the 25 to 30 miles to the gallon Japanese auto. And the auto started pouring into the country. And they tried to counter that by imposing tariffs on the Japanese autos. But with the money that the Japanese manufacturers made, they brought their factories into the United States, bypassed that tariff. They listened to their customers, they innovated, they made their cars more efficient, they made them bigger, they made them more comfortable, they added more features. And today, as they say, it is history. You think about Toyota, Honda, and Nissan, and they're some of the most popular cars in our country. All right, know the enemy and know yourself. You probably heard that a lot more than just in here. In 100 battles, you'll never be in peril. A good way to look at this is military intelligence is not an oxymoron. A lot of people tend to think about that, but it's not. A uh, good example in history from the Battle of the Bulge, the German Panzer Divisions and Patton's Third Army. Uh, getting to that uh, deep, cold winter, uh, General Patton was convinced that the Germans were going to be mounting a counteroffensive. Nobody believed him, but he had an idea that they were going to pull it off. Nobody else believed him because, as I said, it was winter, it was cold, it was miserable. Uh, the German army had been on the run. Their morale was low. They were low in gasoline. So how could they possibly mount an offensive? And Patton took the three of those, and along with his understanding of history, because he knew the last time the Germans had mounted an offensive in the winter was on Frederick the Great in the 1800s. And he looked at that and said, that's exactly what they're going to do. Not only are they going to mount an offensive, they're going to go right through this little town called Bastogne, where the 101st Airborne was hidden, because through Bastogne was the quickest way to the gasoline reserves being held by the Allies. So Patton knew they were coming. Nobody believed him, but he told his officers, and he told his colonels, and he told his sergeants and his lieutenants, be ready. Get your men ready. Be ready to move at a moment's notice and be able to remove real fast. And when the German army attacked, he was ready. He took 100,000 men and 2,000 tanks and moved them all the way to the north to relieve the 101st and stop the Battle of the Bulge. Reconnaissance and intelligence for business is just as crucial as it is to the military. We need to know what our enemy's goals are, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, as well as our own. We need to know what we know and more importantly, what we do not know. The only thing General Patton did not know is exactly how many tanks and men were coming from the German army. He knew there were going to be tanks and men, but he didn't know how many. Other than that, he knew what to expect, and he prepared accordingly. And it's only when we have all of this information that we can truly make a wise decision. Now, while we've heard about, you know, um, haste makes waste, cleverness has also never been as associated with, long dis with uh, slow decisions. Uh, we need to take the best information we have and make the decision when we need to and move forward. If we sit around and wait forever, our enemy will take advantage of our slowness and take the field from us. A real good business example, and I happen to be there at General Dynamics when this is occurring, uh, called the Battle of the Boats, when the Gerald Ford class aircraft carrier was under development. That's one of the new super carriers that's out there on the ocean. Uh, General Dynamics was approached by the Navy and said, we want you to partner with Newport News because Newport News has not built a new power plant since the Nimitz class, and all those engineers and men have retired or are dead. You, however, have built new power plants with the Seawolf class, and your people are still here, so we want you to power Newport News 
uh, to help them develop the power plant for this carrier. Well, the executives of General Dynamics took that and said, well, wait a second, our stock price is four times that of Newport News. They don't have the expertise there anymore, we do. We have a business opportunity here to buy out Newport News, take complete control of the submarine industry, because it was just General Dynamics and Newport News, and then have the lion's share of the surface ship industry. General Dynamics had Bath Ironworks building some destroyers, but not aircraft carriers and not the big tankers. So this would have been a win-win-win all the way around for the guys at General Dynamics. So they put in their bid, Newport News accepted their bid, but what they didn't know or what they forgot about was a group of people in Washington, D.C. called Congress. They said, nope, because that is going to give you a monopoly. And unfortunately, put the Bosch on the buy. But it would have been a sweet deal if it had passed. Okay, we're going to take a break here. This is at slide eight. We're about halfway through the presentation. Uh, Steve, did you see any questions come up yet? Nothing, nothing in the chat room yet. So um, we can ask okay. Daryl to unmute everybody and see if anybody has anything that they want to ask you. No, this is Avis. You certainly know your military history. Oh, well, thank you, Avis. It's very interesting the way you're applying. You thank my that. father, my grandfather. Yeah, you are um, very interesting the way you work it in the boardroom. Uh, where does guerrilla warfare, which is a term thrown around a lot today, fit into this? Or is that something you're going to get to later in your presentation? If I was going to look at guerrilla warfare, you could look at that as fourth generation war. That's kind of what we're dealing with today. You're dealing with Al-Qaeda and the terrorists. Um, if you're creating guerrilla warriors with your people, as an example in business, you're talking, again, you're talking about agile. Think about a commando squad. Uh, these guys are handed their packs, their weapons, and said, go blow something up, go steal something, go capture something. That's it. They're left on their own. And they simply go out there and take care of it. If they need an airstrike, they call it an airstrike. If they need hit, they need a pickup, they get picked up. Other than that, they are completely free to go do what they need to do. And that's difficult from a business perspective because there's a lot of trust that has to go into that. Hey, how much money are you spending? How much time? When am I going to see results? You know? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Anyone else have anything for Patrick? Okay, we'll save that for the end then, Patrick. Continue. Okay. All right. Speed. I said speed and essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness, travel by unexpected routes, and hit him where he's taken no precautions, no preparations. In short, if you move fast enough, the enemy will actually appear to move backwards. Think about a chess game. If you could move three of your pieces for every time your opponent moved one of his, that chess game would be over very quickly. I don't care how good of a chess player the other guy was. History, think about the Blitzkrieg of France. And after the, French, after the uh, German army went around you know, the Maginot Line, the German tanks surprisingly were actually inferior to the French tanks. Their guns were smaller, their armor was lighter. However, the German army had more men in their tank. Now that might seem like a bad idea, but in the French tanks, they had three men. German tanks had five. They had one guy whose whole purpose was just to load the gun. Another guy whose whole purpose was to fire the gun. In the French tank, the same guy loaded and fired his cannon. So the German army could move their tank, fire literally on the move, faster than the French army could react. The result of their actions led to a complete capture of the city of Paris in 46 days. From the time they hit the French border to the time they captured Paris was 46 days. A very big embarrassment. And this is what happens when second versus third generation warfare meets. You know, the French had superior firepower, but the Germans had speed and agility, and they took advantage of it. And speed and agility is essential in business as it is in war. Uh, we'll get into, if I get, a little, if I get time at the end, I'll, get, uh, I'll expand a little bit more on the OODA loop. But the OODA stands for observe, or, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. But take advantage of the OODA loop 
and keep attacking your opponent, as I said, three moves to their one. The, event, the concept of the OODA loop is to try to make decisions and act on those decisions faster than your opponent can react to the action you just did. Eventually, you're moving so quick that it doesn't matter what they do. General Patton was a master at this. He would hit the Germans at so many different points on their line. By the time they reacted to his first incursion, he had already moved 30 miles in, into uh, behind their people. Speed from our side, from a business side, allows us to be first to market, to react quickly to changes. Again, you have to have a kind of a nimble reaction squad. React quickly to changes, grab opportunities as soon as we see them, and keep our enemy off balance. But this is very important that a great idea, no matter how great it is, if it requires a slow process to come alive, it's doomed to failure. It doesn't matter how great your idea is. If you're going to take you three years to get it even before the board of review, you might as well not even start. And this is hard for larger corporations trying to uh, advance a project quicker. And there is the slow lumbering, all right, I need to sustain what I've already built. Then I got the faster group. Well, okay, I'm, I'm producing my current product, but then my development side needs to be nimble. I've seen software groups that are literally what we call a rapid prototype. Hey, does this work? Okay, that works okay. Here's a couple of bugs. Try to fix that. All right, next week. Here's the next rev. Here's the next rev. Here's the next rev. Constantly re, uh, revolving and constantly evolving the software to make it faster. A good way to think about that, think about the age of the iPhone and rapid prototyping. When those phones hit the market, okay, you got the iPhone. I've got the iPhone 6. Oh, man, are you in the Stone Age? I've got the iPhone 16. I mean, I just bought this damn thing. How the hell did they come out with 16 so fast? And the iPhone people, they were literally releasing prototypes to their beta testers, letting them run around with them. Hey, try it out. Do you get better reception? Is it slower reception? How's the video? How many games can you download? If you've got all your apps open at the same time, can you, you know, still play uh, Duke Nukem on your little... Uh, iPhone, how's the picture quality? And then taking the feedback, putting out the next round of prototypes until they thought they had it right, and then going into production. You know, central tenet in Sun Tzu and warfare is it's all based on deception. And you think about this, letting your imaginations run, letting your enemies' imaginations just run wild. And think about the Civil War, General Lee, up against the Union Army. General Lee's army was almost always outnumbered in the engagements that he fought. But he would deceive his enemies by taking the same 100 men and marching them back in front of where he knew the Union spies were with different flags. So this time they'd have a red flag, then they'd have a green flag, then a blue flag, then a yellow flag. By the time the spies went back, they'd say, oh, Lee's got thousands and thousands of men. No, he only had about 2,000 men but he made them believe that they were bigger than they really were. And it gave him an advantage. Now in our case, we can't lie in business. and it'll get you in a whole lot of legal uh, implications, but you don't have to be 100% forthcoming with your true plans are. You provide what you must and let their enemies' minds fill in the details and then go back to the OODA loop, again, which we'll get into a little bit later. If you're close, you see far. If you're weak, you appear strong. If you're ready, you appear disorganized. Consistency, however, can make you predictable. If you're constantly being deceptive, then they're all, always going to know that you're doing the opposite. So you have to find a balance in there. So are you close to finishing your product? If you're real close, make your opponent think that you're months away. You know, if you are weak, I mean, you don't have the resources, you don't have the men yet, you haven't hired the right people. Oh, yeah, we've got staff. We've got money to spare. Don't worry about it. If you're ready to go, Make it look like you're disorganized. If you want them to think that you're a disorder, if you want them to uh, think that you're ready to go, though, you need to be ready. Because eventually they're going to call you bluff. So the deception works until somebody calls your bluff. So you can deceive, but you better be ready to move forward with an actual plan. Good example of this, think about P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum, I mean, he had a whole host of uh, attractions. And he said he had a tattooed man. He did have a tattooed man. There were tattoos all over his body. He had a, boy, a guy that was called the dog boy. His whole head was, his whole body was covered in fur from top to bottom. And sometimes he sold a truth and sometimes he sold a lie. And the Fiji mermaid was the uh, closest thing to a lie. It literally was a trout and the top of a monkey <laughs> that he put together. But 
people were so hooked to come and see him that they went in, put their 50 cents in, and came in to see the little mummified Fiji mermaid. Now, those skilled in war bring the enemy to the field of battle and are not brought there by him. Good way of thinking about this. You heard this term is, uh, you're in my wheelhouse. This is my area of expertise. I have the advantage. You think about the Battle of Thermopylae with the 300 Spartans against the Persians. Uh, and the Greeks had about three to 5,000. They had some other auxiliaries from the other uh, colonies from Athens and such. But uh, the Persian army had hundreds of thousands, some estimates even up to a million. And the Persian army came across the quickest way into the rest of Greece was through this small part. They could have gone around them. They could have found another way. But when they approached Leonidas and his men and said, throw down your arms, Leonidas said, you want it, come and get it. And he played off of the ego of the king, King Xerxes, who then decided he was going to make him pay for it and charge him. And the Spartans made the Persians pay dearly. They did lose eventually, but they killed over 20,000 of them. And the way they did it was they narrowed down the front that they had to fight on. The little path that they were marching across was only about 30 to 40 feet wide. When you've got 100,000 men, it doesn't do you any good trying to push them all through a 30-foot hole. And the Spartans, with their failing tactics, they were trained for this, and they did it all their lives. We want to own the high ground, in the, or sorts, in this case, the narrow ground. But you want to force your enemy to fight from a weak or a disadvantaged position. You maximize your strength. You minimize his, as in this case. From business, we want to master critical technologies, have controlling interests in patents, own relationships with key individuals, such as board members, congressmen, uh, committee, uh, relate, uh, committee officials. If we do that, we limit our enemy's ability to advance their tech, to surpass us or even match us. If you master the next critical technology, if we're thinking about energy as an example here, now, Cold fusion has always been a kind of a myth and a, you know, and a uh, fantasy, but for sake of argument, if you could actually master that technology and then own a controlling interest in the patents, obtain key relationships with the Energy Committee in Congress, you could put your company in business for the next foreseeable thousand years until something new comes along. You also want to make your name known as a force to be reckoned with. Powerful brand is akin to a fearsome reputation. Think about the Navy SEALs or the Russian Spetsnaz. These are guys you don't want to mess with. Same thing with corporations. If you had to go up against Lockheed Martin, if you had to go up against Toyota, or if you had to go up against Amazon, it might seem like a formidable mountain to try and climb. Good thing in business, there's only one place to see the ball fall in this country, and that is Times Square in New York City. It's a ball. It's a ball that falls a couple of feet and lights up a number at the bottom. But the rooms are sold out years in advance. The vendors who sell their trinkets, they have to pay licenses. And these people make tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for everybody to come together in one spot and watch a ball fall. But they bring the people to their battleground. Instead of sitting at your TV, you really want to see the ball fall, you got to come here. All right, you engage in actual fighting and victory is long and coming, men's weapons are going to get dull. They're going to get bored. They're going to get tired. If you lay siege, that means trying to uh, strangle out a town, you will exhaust your strength. You know, it's like banging your head against a wall only results in a headache. Some doors that we think we have opportunities are actually walls. And trying to pry them open isn't going to do you any good. That door is just simply not going to open. That person doesn't want to give up that tech. That person doesn't want to share in the resources. Don't bother exhausting your resources trying to open them. Keep your mission in mind. What is your goal? Remember I said this is a what to do, not a how to do it. Keep the mission in line. Be innovative and find another way or make one. A good, where that quote came from is Hannibal. All roads lead to Rome and some are less traveled, not as obvious. Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, sacked Rome on the backs of elephants going across the snow-covered Alps. Kind of caught the uh, Roman people by surprise. A real good example in history is Genghis Khan's siege of Volo High. 
Genghis Khan and the Mongol horde, their reputation preceded them. They were terrifying. However, Volohai had a big wall, tall, thick, and the city's defenders were well enough armed to hold off the, the uh, golden horde from trying to scale their walls. But they also couldn't sit there like uh, Khan's, you know, Mongols sit outside their gates forever. So they said, what do you want? You know, what do you want to make you go away? What Khan wanted was to sack the city, but he wasn't going to tell them that. So he said, give me 1,000 cats and 10,000 sparrows. So they went around the city, rounded up all the house cats, all the strays, grabbed all the birds, brought them out in cages and gave them to them. He dipped all their tails in tar, lit them on fire, and let them go outside the city walls. All those birds and cats ran home and set 10,000 fires around the city. And while the city's defenders were busy fi uh, fighting the fire, the horde attacked, scaled the walls, and took the city. From a business side, if anybody's ever heard of Eugene Stoner, he's the inventor of the Armalite rifle, number 15. Uh, currently, are a, the adaptation of the M16, or the civilian version of the M16. The story of how we ended up with the M16 rifle is actually kind of interesting. Stoner, along with uh, Springfield, were trying to compete for the Army's next generation rifle. This is between the Korean and the uh, Vietnam War. The Army came out and said, I want a battle rifle, a new battle rifle, detachable magazine, 30 caliber round. Semi-automatic possibility to go full automatic. So the two of them competed. Eugene Stoner had his AR-10, which is a 308. That's the caliber they wanted. Springfield had their M14. While Stoner's rifle was lighter, both rifles were accurate, but the M14 seemed more robust. So they went with the M14. Uh, about a year later, the Air Force came up and said, hey, we'd like a new rifle too, but we don't need a big battle cartridge. We just need something for our local security forces. Anybody got anything? Stoner came out and said, well, I've got my... AR-10, uh, I could redesign the chamber for a smaller cartridge if you like. So hence came the 556 by 45 cartridge or known as the civilian 223 and sold it to the Air Force and sold it to the Air Force. And the Air Force bought 80,000 of these rifles. A Couple of years later though, as the lessons in Vietnam were being learned, M14 while being a good rifle was not very well adapted to the jungle. It was big, it was heavy, it was hard to maneuver in the tight canopy of the jungle. It also only had a 15 to 20 round magazine where the more nimble, shorter AK-47 had a 30 round magazine. So the Army came back to Congress and says, hey, this rifle's not working out, we need something better. And they says, well, you're not getting a new program, but if you would like, you can share what the Air Force is using. And hence how the AR-15 became the M-16 to the hands of the Army to where it's still with our soldiers even today. So Stoner was trying to get through the, trying to get through the uh, 30 caliber contest, didn't work out, but he went through and hooked up with the Air Force and eventually found his way into the Army. Kind of a backdoor way of getting that rifle into our, our soldier hands. Let's see here. Now, when one treats people of benevolence and justice and righteousness, reposes confidence in them, the army will be united in mind, and all will be happy to serve their leaders. Now, keep in mind, being happy to serve in the army, you're sending men out to kill and be killed. So for people to be happy to live and die at your command, that's a tall order to fulfill for any leader. But leaders must lead. And in short, a commander must command. If you're a leader in your organization, you're the leader for a reason. You were chosen, whether by skill or by, uh, or by your uh, education, uh, they chose you. You're the leader, and in some cases, you're the role model. Uh, you've all been in those situations where you've got a real bad situation, where they've got a real bad problem. They're calling everybody into the room, everybody's sweating bullets, and here comes that one person, that one guy, that one girl, that, ah, oh, thank God they're here. Everybody calms down, because no matter how bad it is, that person knows what to do. That person knows how to guide, that person knows how to motivate. And from leading and motivation, if you're leading, you need to lead from the front where your team can actually see you and be motivated. Um, sure, a lot of people worked long and hard to get that corner office. Your people can't see you. They can't see you making decisions. And if you are an effective leader, you need to show them what an effective leader is like. How do you do, how do you handle conflict? How do you motivate people? How do you direct? How do you get people to work together as a team? If you're doing it from the corner office, nobody's going to see you. So you need to get out and let them see you. 
And from a motivation point, there's only two things that motivate, I'm sorry to say. No matter what it is, it comes down to two, interest and fear. Uh, some people will tell you that they're the same thing. And while they may get similar results, they are not the same. Do you want to be seen as a motivator or as a tyrant? Leading people by fear, you can get instant reaction with fear. However, people eventually overcome their fear of you and it doesn't work, it becomes less effective. Fear also doesn't last as long as being motivated by interest. It takes a little bit of time to build people up to be motivated by interest, but it lasts longer and it builds a stronger relationship. However, there are times when both need to be used. I need you to move now, <laughs> not six months from now, not when you feel like it, now. And sometimes fear has to be used in those cases. For leaders, I mean, respect Trump's charisma. I don't care if, how much people like you. If I don't respect you, I'm not going to trust you. And that trust is earned and not given. It takes a long time to develop that trust, unfortunately, and it can be lost in an instant. Because for all the people out there, there are many, many very intelligent people. For whatever reason, you wouldn't follow them. There's just something about them you just don't trust. Uh, you know they're wise, you know they've got the degrees in the background, but you don't respect them, you don't trust them, and you're not going to follow them. So a good leader is going to seek after their team's well-being. He can provide fair treatment, do reward, and be morally right. In this case, your team comes first, you're second. Uh, many times we tend to think about our own career. How am I going to get ahead? How am I going to get ahead? You get ahead by raising your team up. Uh, one of my first uh, bosses back in General Dynamics, his name is Ed Lemieux, he had engineers of all different levels, from green fresh out of college like me to the senior people who've been around since Skunk Works and Roswell. <laughs> the guy worked in Area 51. Um, but his goal was to build up his people as fast as possible. He wanted a team of experts. He wanted a whole team of senior engineers. He knew fresh blood needed to come in, but as soon as you came in, he wanted to build you up because his team made him look good. He made himself look good by making his team look good. Uh, providing fair treatment, unfortunately, also comes with providing fair punishment. Uh, we don't like to necessarily punish our people. We'd love to give everybody a $5,000 a year raise, but sometimes you do have to come down on people. Being morally right, if you're trying to tell people that you're not doing the right thing, you're cheating on your time card, you can't be cheating on yours. So you have to walk the line if you're gonna be talking the line. You need to know your people, the people you work with, that you have to avoid familiarity because it can lead to contempt. Uh, soldiers for officers and sergeants, they know who the best shots are, they know who the guys are the sneakiest, the guys that can kill the best in hand to hand, and those are the guys unfortunately that get sent off into all these dangerous situations. They know them, they trust them, but they also know there's a possibility they're gonna get killed. But if all of a sudden they become their buddy and their drinking partners, it can all of a sudden affect the uh, officer's judgment of who to send. I don't wanna send my buddy and get killed, I'll just send the second best guy, and instead the entire mission comes apart. Uh, same thing in business. I mean, it's not, there's nothing wrong with being happy and familiar with your, and, or happy and uh, chatty with your uh, workers, but, you also have to realize at the end of the year, you have to judge that person. You have to evaluate them. You have to say, you're doing this right, you're doing that wrong. And in worst case scenario, it may be you that has to terminate them. And you can't have, well, I thought we were friends. It's like, no. But you always want to protect your people. If your superiors are giving you orders to tell your people to do something that you know is going to stretch them to the breaking point, you need to speak up to your superiors and stand up to them. I mean, everybody is willing to give what is necessary to get the job done, but hey, you can only, can't expect people to do 80 hours a week for a week on week on week until the end of the year. Eventually, you're going to lose all your people. Let's see. Okay. And that is the end of it, the backup. I can go to uh, the page on the UDA, or if we can entertain questions, if anybody has any questions. Well, Patrick, this is Steve. I think you can do whichever one you want. We've got plenty of time. Okay. Okay, well, let me move to OODA. Let's see, OODA loop. Yeah, it looks a little busy here, and no, this is not a witch's pentagram in the center, but OODA loop, also known as the Boyd cycle. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, the Boyd cycle came out as a result of actions during the Korean War with our pilots, our fighter pilots. 
the uh, North Korean MiG-15 being supplied by the Russians uh, was faster. It could climb faster. It could turn faster. It had superior firepower. But what the F-86 Sabre had was a full hydraulic control system. And while I couldn't turn faster or climb faster or dive faster, I could change between my maneuvers faster than the MiG. So if I had a MiG behind me, I could pull into a climb and then I look over top. I observe, I orient myself. What is he doing? Is he trying to climb after me? Oh, he's trying to climb after me. Well, now I'm going to turn over this way and level myself out. Is he still on the same maneuver? Oh, yes, he is. And I can change my maneuver again. And it Kind of like what I was saying before, having three moves to the enemy's one. Uh, the neighbors could change between their maneuvers fast enough that they could move themselves into a position that they could safely shoot down the MiG without being shot down themselves. In business, from our observation, uh, we have outside information unfolding interaction with our environment. Our environment can be our supplies, our finances, political actions that are going on, unfolding circumstances of the plant is closing. Uh, we're in layoffs, we're having a hiring freeze. We try to orient ourselves, we're trying to orient our, we're not just orienting our body in this case, we're also trying to orient our mind. I mean, what's going on culturally around us? Are we in a culture, if you think about the Japanese culture, gung-ho, I mean, everybody just worked. They went there and they gave everything for the company. In America, we don't quite think that way, so things are a little bit different. I mean, deciding and acting, once you've oriented yourself, you make a decision. As Patton would say, you take the best information you have at the time you have it, make a decision, and move forward. But during that, you're also looking for feedback. Did I make the right decision? It was the right decision, but I could do this a little bit better. All right. Those feedback goes back to the observation. What did you observe? What changed? Orient yourself again. Decide, make a new decision, or slightly change your previous decision again act but constantly feedback constantly returning and again the purpose of this cycle or this loop everybody has an OODA loop some OODA loops move slower some move faster the ones that move faster and more accurately are the ones that are going to get the advantage and they're the ones that are not in the case of the MiG and the F-86 they're the ones that are not going to get shot down so, Someone's coming. <laughs> okay, and that is it. Uh, if you have copies of this presentation, these references are on the back. Uh, you'll find bits and pieces of uh, strategies and all this, but they almost all start right up here with the Sun Tzu's Art of War. Almost all these other ones borrow from Sun Tzu in one way or another. Some of them are more personal, some are a little more cryptic. But uh, if you want to get into tactics and understanding military tactics, if you understand your business, you can, like I said, if you can apply business and warfare at the same time, see the enemy is just whatever happens to be in your way. And warfare or fighting is just simple conflict and disagreement. You can apply the lessons. Any other questions? I see where somebody wanted to know your last name. So obviously they're going to be in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I thought you put my last I, name on the front, didn't you? When you I have a question. This That's is on the front. Oh, do we have one from somebody else got a question? Please go for it. Nope. Was that a nope? <laughs> no questions. Okay. Um, Patrick, from your experience, um, have you seen people who have gone from uh, the broadsword to the boardroom and screwed it up where their military experience worked against them? I mean, from a personal perspective, I would not have known if they did. Um, like I said, when you talk about the OODA with cultural differences, uh, I mean, again, referencing back to the Second World War, you had two sides of it. You think about uh, the British General uh, Bernard Montgomery. He would attack only when he had overwhelming superior numbers and firepower. Uh, his counterpart, however, Erwin Rommel, was fighting more on the maneuver warfare side. And while Montgomery did push Rommel across Africa, he paid for it dearly. Instead of taking advantage when he could have, the uh, counter to uh, Montgomery, though, was General Patton. He was constantly on the fire and maneuver. 
And when Patton's Third Armor hit Europe, the German army was actually terrified that he was gonna be given command because they knew it would be constantly running onto their heels. So somebody who comes from a different military culture, uh, it's not even so much from the culture of like right now at this time, almost all the soldiers are taught fire and maneuver. Um, but if you would think back to like in World War I, the soldiers that are in the trenches were dealing with or facing machine guns and trench mortars being led by people who are still living in the glory days of charging with lance and sword. So culturally, there was a big difference. And from a business side, uh, they would attack business very, very differently. But as far as actually seeing something, no. The modern day soldiers that I have seen join uh, society and just become you know, civilians. Uh, I have two cousins. One was a command sergeant major in the Marine Corps. The other one was a senior warrant officer. Both of them were master negotiators for their trucks, their houses, and their vacation spots. So they definitely brought some of their tactics with them. Thank you. That was helpful. I don't know if anybody in the audience has any input or not, because certainly in so many of our affiliated chapters, um, we have members and employees who are retired military or uh, have had military experience who then go into the corporate world. And I didn't know if anybody um, would like to share uh, any of their experiences, good, bad, or ugly. So we'll give them a second. Or let's see if there's another question or two out there. Anybody? Yeah, I, th this is Avis. Um, I have a one, my brother in law was a 30 year army man and came out a general. And he was very, he, like uh, Patrick said, a lot of the military men, particularly the more, the more modern military men, uh, are able to us frequently are able to assimilate into the business world and be successful at it. Thank you, Avis. Anyone else? Yeah, it seems. Yeah, Patrick, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead. I'll wait. No, I didn't have anything. <laughs> I just thought you were starting to say something. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, I've I've seen uh, I've, I've I mean I've dealt with uh, ex soldiers, ex marines, uh, ex army, and it just depends on whether or not they were uh, the follower or they were the leader. If they were the leader of men, especially the leader of men in combat, uh, they understood what it meant to take risk. They understood what it meant to lose and uh, how careful that you needed to plan something in order to uh, get your maximum results. And you get uh, some officers that were, uh, they were core master in supply and they come into the business world and they work with bills of material and purchasing and they just rack up the points because it's, it's right in their ballowick. It's their wheelhouse. It's their strength. That is what they were trained for and spent 20, 30 years developing. Uh, this is Avis again. I have one anecdote. Uh, I served on the board of trustees of my church for seven years during a rebuilding process. Also on the board of trustees was a Marine colonel from Vietnam and two sergeant majors from Korea. And it was very interesting to see those dynamics working. Yes, they were, you know, all combat people from two different, completely different kinds of combat and two completely different levels of command. Yet they could still bring this multi million dollar rebuilding fund into being and overseeing getting everything done that had to be done the way it was supposed to be done when it should be done it was for me it was very because i i'm a fan of a history buff and it was very interesting for me to see those dynamics at work all right one last shot for one last question anyone Patrick, I'm sitting here looking at people writing in saying excellent presentation and thank you. Um, I want to do likewise. Um, I've been thrilled. We may have set a record attendance this morning. Uh, I'm not sure. If not, we were close to it because um, we had well over 100 logins. And of course, at some logins, there's more than one person. So you, you attracted a crowd this morning and you did a great job. We appreciate it. Um, I want to... Wish everybody a safe, certainly, 
and happy Memorial Day weekend with family and friends. Um, it's certainly going to be a different, um, a, a different holiday. And oops, I got another question. Will you be sending out the presentation via email? Um, obviously, somebody didn't see. I already answered this in group chat. Everybody who registered, who went online, who went on the line and registered for the webinar, um, not only received the formal invitation and the meeting ID, but in a separate email, that person received the PowerPoint presentation. So if somebody forwarded you the login information, contact that person and ask them to also send you the PowerPoint presentation, which they received. Or to make it quick, just email me and I'll take care of it. It's steve at nma1.org. I'll be happy to send it to you if your local contact isn't answering your email. So, um, okay, um, Patrick, you get the last word. Steve, you'll be happy to do that. I just want to say days. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. a lady was speaking. What did you say? Yes, you'll, you'll be happy to email them the PPT for a few more days. Yeah, I can send the, the PowerPoint today. Um, it'll be online probably by the first of the week, the, the whole live webinar. And I apologize, I'm having to use a non-traditional, uh, actually I don't even have any speakers, I'm listening through my new PC. <laughs> so it's a little hard to hear people. All right, Patrick, you get it. I just want to say thank you very much, everybody, uh, for attending and listening in. I uh, hope you got something out of it. And I said, if those of you who have not gotten a copy of the presentation, we'll make sure you get a, get one sent out to you. Uh, again, if you want to touch base with me, just understand that I you know do work with a defense contractor, so I can't be sending you know files out <laughs> through the email, but I can definitely respond to questions. Okay, thank you. And, and thank uh, you very much. Well, Patrick, we'll see you again at three o'clock this afternoon. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you.